Good evening to you all. Lovely to see you. Um, my name is Tony Travers. I'm Associate Dean here in the School of Public Policy. Welcome to those of you uh, from inside and outside the school. I've got a lot of things to read out, so bear with me for a moment. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the event in a moment, but it's part of a series called the LSE UK Economy Series. And the hashtag is hashtag LSE UK Economy. And then you can explore our dedicated hub showcasing LSE research and commentary on the state of the UK economy and its future by visiting lse.ac.uk forward slash research forward slash UK economy. Well, anyway, you can look it up, but if you search on that, you'll find it. So uh, much to be said about um, the economy. Before I introduce the panel, I'd just like to say a little bit about uh, the event. Um, well, you can see on the screen in front of you, the UK's uh, 2022 autumn economic crisis why did it happen and what next? Well, sort of an understated question, really, given the scale of what did happen. I mean, just to remind us all, uh, on the 23rd of September, the then Chancellor launched a growth plan in the so-called mini budget, uh, which involved tax cuts, support for the uh, for energy bills. But of course, the whole thing was effectively funded by borrowing rather than uh, any commitment to taxation. Uh, the market reaction to this triggered uh, a classic sterling crisis, of which there have been a number over the years, but also um, a spike in UK uh, government guilt uh, yields. And of course, that in turn led indirectly to a risk of pension fund insolvency. So it was an absolute um, coming together of a political action that led to an economic uh, crisis that then triggered a political further action and so on into a sort of political economy death spiral, uh, not to understate it too much. So um, this of course led to the then chancellor being removed and then finally the prime minister resigning. And now we face on the 17th of November, another bigger presumably or largely reversing much of what hasn't already been reversed, uh, reversing much of what was decided in this earlier time and um, a new series of economic and political policies for the years ahead. So the event will look at what happened and why. And I'll introduce our speakers who are Charles Bean, who's a British economist, professor of economics at the LSE and former deputy Governor for Monetary Policy at the Bank of England and, of course, also formerly Chief Economist at the Bank. Alexander Evans is a Professor in pre uh, Public Policy at the LSE. Uh, he was previously Strategy Director in the Cabinet Office and has also worked as an advisor at 10 Downing Street. Stephanie Flanders, Senior Executive Editor for Economics at Bloomberg and Head of Bloomberg Economics. And Stephanie, of course, was previously BBC Economics Editor, last but not least, Jean Frieda, Senior Visiting Fellow at LSE School of Public Policy, and uh, Jean is Executive Vice President, Global Strategist, based in London, currently serves as a rotating member of PIMCO's Investment Committee. So what we're going to do is have three or four minutes from each speaker on why did it happen, and then in a slight break with tradition, three or four minutes from each on what next. Uh, and I'm going to do it in alphabetical order, which is as it was written down, as good a way as any. So we'll go through this process, have a bit of a discussion up here, and then uh, I'll come to you. So plenty of time for Q&A, questions and answers, your own views on this. If you don't think the panel knows why it happened, you say so. And if you think you know what's going to happen next, tell them. Definitely. Anyway, <laughs> right, enough from me. Charlie. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so wh why did it happen? I think it's helpful to start by going back to March and the uh, previous fiscal statement from the Chancellor, uh, because at that time he had left himself about 30 billion of headroom in the medium term uh, relative to his objective of getting the debt to GDP ratio falling three years out. And during the leadership campaign, uh, Liz Truss, who had been saying she was going to 
uh, reverse the uh, implementation of the health and social care and corporate tax elements uh, of uh, Sunak's budget was saying that it could all be financed from the 30 billion headroom. Uh, so the question naturally rises, well, why did it create such problems when she went ahead and did it? Uh, well, the first thing was uh, that the economic outlook was markedly worse come beginning of September than it was back in March. Uh, that's partly because of the increase in inflation associated with what was happening uh, in the Ukraine and its implication for global energy prices and grain prices and so forth. And that has a direct consequence uh, on things like benefit spending, which are indexed to inflation, uh, but also uh, interest rates uh, worldwide had been uh, rising. So about two percentage points uh, higher right along the yield curve than they were back in March. And that adds to the government's debt interest burden. And it comes through pretty quickly these days uh, as a result of the Bank of England's quantitative easing, which has swapped long dated bonds for stuff which is uh, which changes whenever bank rate uh, changes. And uh, pretty much that 30 billion of headroom uh, had uh, become something in excess of a, a 10 billion shortfall, somewhere between 10 and 20 billion. Uh, on top of that, you had the, uh, the incoming government uh, deciding it wanted to go through with its... Uh, uh, declared tax measures, which it saw of uh, as key to getting growth going. I think it's worth saying here that having chosen a relatively hard Brexit, um, it was natural for enthusiasts for that Brexit to be looking for a light regulation, light tax model, a so-called Singapore on Thames model. Uh, it wasn't a discussion of that during the referendum, but it was a, in many ways a natural a corollary. Um, the mini budget package, um, there's really two bits. I think the, the energy um, uh, um, protection part of it for households and businesses, although that was expensive, 60 billion this year and somewhere between 100 and 150 billion, uh, probably over the two years of the measure, but it was explicitly temporary. Uh, Rishi Sunak had plenty of fiscal events that weren't accompanied by OBR assessments or anything like that, but they were all temporary actions to deal with a, a specific problem that needed immediate action. Uh, the issue, uh, I think, with the mini budget, though, was the uh, tax cuts uh, amounting to 45 billion in the medium term, uh, which were intended to be permanent relative to the uh, trajectory that was uh, previously programmed. Um, so you layer that on top of a, a 10 billion plus shortfall, you're looking at quite a uh, a significant 50, 60 billion uh, shortfall in the medium term, which would imply the debt to GDP ratio would be rising. Uh, that alone, I don't think uh, was uh, the explanation for why things unravel. Because I think uh, you need also uh, to think, well, first of all, about the sequencing of what's going on here. Um, Liz Truss often uh, drew parallels with Mr. Thatcher. Um, now, I was, you know, around during the Thatcher uh, era. I mean, I'm, I'm old enough, actually, to remember as going to the IMF. I was working in the Treasury <laughs> back in the 70s then. Um, Mrs. Thatcher, it was, uh, it was actually a very methodical process. So her first term, was getting the public finances under control, getting inflation down. The second term was much more focused on supply side reform. Uh, and then it was only in the third term 
that you had tax cuts, which they were sort of reward for doing the hard work earlier on. So I think it's like a three course meal, uh, you know, starter, get the macro picture right, structural reform is the main course, and then tax cuts for dessert. So basically, uh, you know, the trust government didn't want their greens and their protein, and they went straight to the dessert with the uh, tax cuts. Uh, so, I, you know, that's the first thing, they got the sequencing uh, wrong. Uh, secondly, uh, alongside this, they had been systematically rubbishing the three key elements of the macroeconomic institutional framework. Uh, so quite a lot of uh, denigrating of the bank's record on uh, controlling inflation. Um, I happen to think the bank did get a bit behind the curve, but 80% of the high inflation that we have now is down to Vladimir Putin. Um, uh, you know, they've also talked about uh, possibly changing the mandate to more, make it more directive. Uh, secondly, um, uh, denigrating the treasury as a, a home of abacus economics. Uh, which is, to me, it's just actually accounting and recognizing that things add up. But uh, for Liz Truss, uh, you know, she clearly saw that as a problem. And the fact that they hired, they fired the head of the Treasury, Tom Scholar, uh, on Quasi Quarteng's first day as Chancellor, uh, I think also sent an extremely bad signal. And the third thing was sidelining the Office of Budget Responsibility. Um, which wouldn't have mattered if the fiscal event was just about the uh, energy price uh, guarantee, but because it had these permanent fiscal, uh, these permanent tax uh, cuts, I think it was problematic. Um, so they all added up to something that looks somewhat reminiscent of what you see in some, uh, under some populist governments in, in Eastern Europe or Latin America uh, or whatever, uh, which accounted for the initially uh, adverse reaction in the markets. Uh, and then that collided with issues in the financial markets themselves associated uh, with the way pension funds were operating and their use of uh, liability-driven investments, uh, which acted as an amplifying mechanism. Uh, I won't say anything about that because I think Jean will probably talk uh, about that. So I'll pass okay. on at that point. Thanks very much. I'll then come back to you on the what next um, in a moment. Alexander. Well, I'm going to move from the elegance of a free course meal to uh, fast food. We've all been there, haven't we, on the motorway, uh, the hunger pang strike. And you think against your better judgment that a quick swing into a service station and a quick <laughs> imbibing of fast food is going to do your body and soul good. Um, so I think, I think a key ingredient here was decision making in time. And a prime minister and a chancellor making a set of decisions at pace that were consequential and were judged to be consequential by the markets as well as by others. Um, and uh, so, so really here, I think there's something about um, time and decision making against, let's face it, uh, two liabilities. The liability of a winter that everybody knew uh, was going to be hard, and the uncertain liability of what would the economy look like next year for the UK, which is material to another liability, which is the next election date. Uh, so I think in that light, decision-making time and decision-making by the Prime Minister and Chancellor are integral to this. And if I can channel uh, Will Self, uh, the great English uh, economist, I mean novelist, um, who once wrote a, a rather indifferent short story on motorways that begins, some people lose their sense of perspective, others lose their sense of scale. And in this fast food decision-making, I think what was lost was the sense of the scale of a liability being accrued, um, how consequential that would be when judged, not just by the markets, but also judged internationally. Um, if I may, I will offer one uh, soupçon of reassurance. We might think this is very extraordinary in political terms, 
uh, I, I printed out just before I came down a, uh, a classified memo from a declassified memo, I should say. Uh, um, uh, I, uh, also, not using not using not using Gmail. I'm not using Gmail. Um, but this is from 19 uh, March 1952, and this is about this is the first ministerial correspondence about raising the pension age in the UK to offset the growing liabilities uh, from paying pensions in UK public finances. So if we kid ourselves that only certain governments like to delay financial liabilities <laughs> and not grapple uh, with the real problems that, that face society in the longer term, uh, the archives are always a good reminder that this is a, uh, this is a human condition problem, but it's also a problem of the political condition. Very good, thank you. Stephanie, I should have said Stephanie has to leave a little early. So when she does leave a little early, it's not a, well, I don't think it's going to be it's a not protest. A to it's not a protest will be the best heard. part, which will be the questions. But anyway, right. it? Um, we will hopefully get to them quite, quite quickly. I, just to sort of, um, I think we're all going to end up with quite complementary um, ways of looking at this. Charlie's given you the, um, the, the nuts and bolts of the, what contributed in economic terms. And then we've also had that sense of the perspective of the decision-making under pressure and a natural politi political desire not to have a crisis tomorrow, just have a crisis sometime in the future. Um, taking a slightly sort of global perspective and a little bit more sympathetic perspective potentially towards the government, I think we should remember there were two very difficult tasks that every developed, more or less every developed country government is going through at the moment. And this trust government faced and uh, the current government, the Sunak government faces. On the one hand, you're trying to bring down inflation whilst protecting house, doing what you can to protect households from the big squeeze that's caused by that inflation. But when you give that support, not getting in the way too much of the Bank of England, the central banks, efforts to bring down inflation, all while not causing a recession. Actually achieving those three things, getting inflation down, helping households and avoiding a recession is quite a tricky combination and we may yet see very few governments pull it off. So that was already a very tough job. I would argue, and Jean may say a bit more about this, I think there was also a sort of um, implicit job facing governments now, which was to, you know, as we see interest rates going up around the world, governments had to prepare for that time where the cost of borrowing was going to start to go up, that it was no longer going to be free and without consequence, more or less, um, to borrow more. We've had basically since the global financial crisis, since 2008, debt stocks as a share of GDP, public debt, has grown enormously in every developed economy. But in almost all cases, the cost of financing that debt in absolute terms has actually gone down because interest rates have been so low and falling. So money has been effectively free for governments. We knew under almost any circumstance that that was no longer going to be the case in the next few years. You don't have to believe that inflation is going to stay at 5% to know that interest rates are going to be at slightly more normal um, levels. So if you're a government and you're sort of wanting to stay in the good graces of investors and to be following at least reasonably sensible policies, you have to show that you're aware of these two challenges and do something. On paper, the energy package for households was a decent response to the first, doing some kind of help for households. And actually having a growth plan that involves supply side reforms was not a bad way to, to think about the second one, because if you can grow a bit faster, it's, you can sustain a higher cost of borrowing or you won't indeed need to borrow as much. The problem came in the way that the trust government, the speed and the way the trust government went around that, because you need to show that you're aware of the trade-offs. You know, if you're going to help households and spend lots of money and put lots of money into the economy, you need to sort of be cognizant, show that you're cognizant of the fact that that makes the Bank of England's job a bit harder to put more money in the economy. So you target it just to the people who really need it to try and minimize that sort of negative effect that you're sort of getting in the way of the Bank of England's job. And you make it temporary, as temporary as you can. And if you're gonna have some kind of, um, if you're gonna have tax cuts, you make sure they're funded, maybe by a windfall tax, you know, in a way that you're not actually adding to this long-term burden and you're not, again, not making the Bank of England's job harder. None of that was in any of that plan. The energy package itself was about as broad and untargeted as could be and lasted for two years. 
markets could probably have swallowed that, but you also then had permanent untargeted tax cuts and also just a sort of general signals the apparent lack of recognition of any of those trade-offs. You know, Guazi Kwateng didn't seem to see that there were downsides to any of these policies. And I think all of that, along with this sort of neglect of institutional constraints that have previously been sort of guardrails for policymakers, things like having a permanent secretary, a senior civil servant who's been there through many, many governments and could provide a kind of sage bit of wisdom and having the Office of Budget Responsibility mark your homework, you know, all of that together made them, created the conflagration that we saw. But I don't think we should be any doubt. I mean, a lot of governments will, they will, will hopefully <laughs> not manage it so spectacularly badly, but they will all face some version uh, of this challenge. And it's a great gift, we're gonna talk about the future, but it is a great gift to the, to the opposition that the government has now been landed with the blame for all of the rise in mortgage rates. It's obviously not the case, you know, mortgage rates would have gone up um, anyway. I think there's some other sort of interesting political and economic consequences, but we shall get onto those later. Very good, we will. It's a political economy event by any standards as we started off by observing. Gee, last but not least. Right, okay. Um, so kind of following on uh, from Stephanie and also kind of, I, I think, I liked Alex's point about this notion of the scale of the liability being accrued. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different perspective in terms of the buildup of vulnerabilities that preceded the event, um, because I don't think there was proper recognition uh, by the government and maybe even at some level the markets as to what was actually happening. Um, and the perspective I'd like to try to give is that, you know, for any good or bad thing that happens in the economy, it's often a function of how vulnerable, what the vulnerabilities, what the scale of the vulnerabilities are when that shock hits. And in this case, I think that the scale of that vulnerability was really about the, around the pension fund industry that, that Charlie mentioned. Um, but there were other vulnerabilities as well. Um, you know, the UK went into this shock having one of the largest current account deficits that it's ever had. It was reliant, as, as the former governor of the Bank of England said, on the, on the kindness of strangers. Uh, it had never been this reliant on the kindness of strangers. It needed a lot of foreign financing. Um, and, you know, I think there was a reasonable argument as well that the Bank of England was also behind the curve. It sort of faced uh, the worst of the trade-offs that Stephanie alluded to, to in terms of a sense of overheating in the labor market, inflation running very hot in spite of the fact that growth was quite weak. What we were learning from this is that potential growth was very weak in the UK, maybe as a function of Brexit, maybe as a function of other factors. Uh, but the point was that growing a little, you know, even a little bit was generating quite a bit of underlying inflation pressure. And then the news hits. Um, and effectively, just to try to explain the, what happened with liability driven investing, uh, the pension system here is sort of divided between defined contribution and defined benefits. Defined benefits, workers are told in advance what they'll uh, receive when they retire. It's a benefit, defined. Um, those liabilities typically don't change over, over time from the company's perspective. Um, but in terms of the company that's managing those liabilities, they do change as a function of interest rates. Um, the, the discount rate which is basically the long-term bond yield, uh, discounts the cash flow of those liabilities. And as bond yields rise, the liabilities, um, the net present value of the liabilities goes down. And when bond yields fall, the opposite happens. Um, and so in this case, for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into, um, the, this liability-driven investing model was reliant on leverage. Um, so companies had not, uh, put enough assets in to match the liabilities that were in the plans. And so the, the, the managers of the pension funds basically had to employ leverage in order to achieve their return targets on their assets to match their liability side. Now, you know, over the course of the entire year, interest rates had been rising and the gilts, which were borrowed, uh, money was borrowed to fund those gilts. Basically the gilt price was going down, the yield was going up. And there were margins that had to be paid on the leverage, on the borrowing on those, uh, on those gilts. And so for a time, the pension funds were, were able to meet those margins. Um, but then the shock happens, almost 150 basis points over the course of a week. 
Um, as yields go up, if you recall, their liabilities go down. They don't need as many gilts. They don't need as many risky assets, but they're getting margin calls on um, all of these levered positions. And so they have to sell something in order to meet those margin calls. And the, the most liquid thing in their portfolios was gilts. So gilts are falling, fiscal liabilities are going up. The Bank of England says they're going to start selling bonds, quantitative tightening. And in turn, pension funds are selling, fire selling gilts into an illiquid market. Um, otherwise, I don't think you would have seen nearly the response. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I think, you know, in, in, some, in some senses, maybe, um, you know, we've, we've drawn too strong of a conclusion about the risk to fiscal sustainability. Not that it was a, an extremely fiscally irresponsible plan, but the notion that we now need to pivot back to hard austerity. Um, so I'll pause there. Okay, very good. Well, now that's the why did it happen uh, part. Now I'm going to go in reverse order this time in the what next. And I note that the guilt yields are still, still well above the 2.25% they were before all this began, aren't they? They're still higher. They're quite a bit higher. George, so what next? Yeah, so the interesting thing is, I mean, just to give you some numbers, um, before this all happened, um, you know, the, the market was pricing um, a peak guilt yield in, uh, sorry, a peak, you know, Bank of England policy rate of 2.75% in July. And just for comparison's sake, the US was pricing 3.15. So yield started going up everywhere globally, which is what Liz Truss kept saying over and over again. Um, this was a global problem, not a UK specific problem. Um, and at the peak, at the worst of this, uh, policy rates were priced to go up to over 6% in the UK. Now they're priced to go up to 4.7%, a little bit below peak pricing in the US. Um, so it looks like we've just had a round trip and everything is, is hunky-dory. Um, the problem is that, you know, for the mortgage market, um, which is, is a function of structured products, banks basically produce these mortgage-backed securities and sell them into the market. Primary buyers were pension funds. Pension funds are no longer buying these. They're selling these because they need to raise cash. Their preference is to reduce the amount of leverage they have for obvious reasons. And as a result of that, mortgage costs will be persistently higher. Um, in terms of, of the question, which is where do we go from here? Um, you know, I would actually start with the Bank of England uh, saying that we have an entrenched inflation problem here. Um, now, fiscal policy has a huge role to play in that. Um, but I think you know, the starting point is one where the growth sacrifice required to get inflation down seems likely to be quite great because we've now got entrenched inflation running at six to 7% annualized. Um, and so at some level, you need a tighter monetary policy, um, which the Bank of England has been quite resistant to. They've been one of the most uh, focused central banks on their forecast, in spite of the fact that their forecast has been really bad. Most other central banks have basically said, we really don't know where inflation is going to go. It's very unpredictable right now. And so we're gonna focus on you know, the, the here and now, which is inflation keeps surprising, so we're gonna to continue to tighten. Fiscal, on the other hand, I think uh, needs to, to strike a better balance. Um, it needs to strike, as, as Stephanie alluded to, a better balance between avoiding overkill on the spending side, which might be a natural bias of a conservative government, uh, because there is a risk that you just dig a deeper hole. You know, the more you cut, the more growth falls, and you know, you end up having to cut more and more. So I think in my mind, it's probably a more uh, tax focused strategy. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, yeah, just quickly on the on the cost, I think it, it is true, it depends when you go back, if you actually just go back to the days of the mini budget, all of what I think was called the more on premium um, has, has gone, the sort of the extra cost to the UK that you can see in long-term interest rates and guilt yields. Um, just from the craziness or the perceived craziness of the of the trust government has gone. So if you look at it compared to what's happened in Germany and other places, we're now roughly the same. And that that premium was, at one point was going to cost tens of billions of pounds a year just for the exchequer for, for higher higher rates. But as Jean says, rates are still higher and they are rising everywhere. And the gap, you know, we're not we haven't seen mortgage rates come back off the increase um, that you had before. So the sort of short-term extra cost to the exchequer is gone, but households still face that higher mortgage rate. 
I think along with, you know, another reason why mortgage rates are staying high is just that, you know, banks are also expecting the house market to crash now, or at least to fall significantly, and they're having to make provisions for uh, potential losses uh, on their house, on their mortgage um, portfolio. So I think that's, that's probably another reason. I think one real cost, I mean, I said the Conservatives have now been, you know, as as Gordon Brown was somewhat unfairly, but successfully by the Conservatives labelled as you know, causing the global financial crisis, or at least all the financial damage to the UK from the global financial crisis. Um, it's, it, it seems at least at the moment that uh, the Conservatives will be lathered with all of the political cost of having rate, uh, caused higher mortgage rates, which is, as I said, not entirely um, right. But I think the, the more lasting cost for the country is a diminished ability to um, delay and hedge in making these difficult fiscal decisions. I mean, and, and Jean, has, Jean has alluded to this. I mean, you would probably want to, for example, and he may do this actually, but if you currently we have, we try, I think Charlie will correct me, but I think we have always said we want a debt falling as a share of GDP within a three year time frame. A sensible thing to do in an uncertain environment would be to say five year time frame. Does Rishi Sunak have so much credibility with markets given his past tax raising record um, that he can do that or will he worry about that worst case scenario which is another bad market reaction to his to the fiscal to the statement coming up in the middle of November. Um, so I worry a bit that some of that room for maneuver that we might have had in a, with a more credible backdrop we've lost, and the risk, as Jean said, is that we will overdo it on the tightening. I kind of agree with him, it would certainly be better if the emphasis was on tax rate raising. And that, of course, has been Rishi's MO. I mean, the, the, the corporation tax rises that the government tried to reverse, you know, were pretty striking to try to take 30 billion pounds out of the corporate sector over a couple of years. Um, so he has shown a willingness to raise taxes that, for example, George Osborne didn't show. Um, but I, I do worry that you will end up, we think you probably need, if you're really determined to lower debt, to have debt falling as a share of GDP, so looking sustainable on the longer term, you need only around 30 billion. But the risk is that we're looking for quite a lot more and that it will be the wrong kind of time. Thank you. Alexander? Well, two ingredients, I think, to propose on my side. I mean, the first is I think there's some really difficult decisions to come around uh, the public sector in the UK, around public sector salaries, around what do you do around uh, the workforce in the public sector, not just in uh, major Whitehall departments, but also across the arm's length bodies that have been such a focus of interest uh, in the last couple of years for government in terms of looking at reform. Um, what do you do around public sector wage demands? Uh, where clearly there are demands uh, for in line with inflation or indeed inflation busting increases, uh, but there isn't going to be the leeway, I think, to uh, likely offer that. And so I think that's, that's a really difficult set of questions, I think, for the government uh, as it approaches the winter and into early next year. My other comment would really be about um, the difficulty of being a late yet an early government. Yeah, this is the culmination of a long period of one party in power, um, uh, you know, subject to whatever might happen at the next election. Um, but it is also because of the proximity of the next election, there's not a lot of time, again, for the government to make its mark. And there's not money for signature policies. If you want to announce something new, if you want to show something that is demonstrably particular to this government, where is the financial wherewithal going to come for that? particularly as, as one of the major themes of the last government, but one, uh, which is levelling up, is firmly back in play. Uh, and the question is, what do you then uh, finance around levelling up uh, to make uh, the substance of that ring true uh, for voters around the country? But we Very should good. remember, they asked, this government is supposed to be implementing the 2019 manifesto, so it can't be that difficult. Yes, Otherwise, people might suggest there needed to be an election. Well, of course, they come and go, they come and go on that idea, don't they? They they think that you need a new mandate, then they don't, then they do. So it's a good point, though. Right now, Charlie. Uh, right. What next? Um, on the, the question of how quickly to stabilise the public finances, 
Um, I think Stephanie is uh, right that uh, this is a good time to say we'll take a bit longer to do it. Um, the question is whether they can get away with that. Now, it, the thing is, uh, it was actually Rishi Sunak who shortened the period uh, to just three years, so it would be unwinding something he had decided to do. Uh, but just as with um, uh, the inflation target, the question of how quickly you get inflation back to target uh, it shouldn't be you know, a fixed thing, it depends on circumstances. So uh, I think there is a good argument for, for saying let's take longer. But then given what's happened, I think it will be very important that um, the plan for getting the debt to GDP ratio on a falling trajectory by what would effectively be the end of the OBR's forecast period needs to be coherent and not involve uh, jiggery pokery, which sometimes in the past has um, chancellors have been indulged in. Um, the question then, well, there's obviously an issue of how much is required, whether it's 30, 40, 50 billion. You see different numbers from different people, but it's chunky, uh, however you, uh, you look at it. Um, it would have been helpful if they had um, stopped the unwinding of the health and social care levy, if somebody had said, you know, don't, don't take it up to the House of Lords, even though you voted on it, because that would be an easy way of uh, implementing a, uh, the necessary uh, enhancement of uh, tax revenues. But it will be difficult to do this uh, mainly squeezing down on public spending for several reasons. Um, I mean, firstly, the existing cash limits were set a year ago when inflation was expected to be much lower. And they were predicated on the assumption that public sector pay would be two to three percent, something like that. Uh, private sector pay growth at the moment, including bonuses, is running at seven percent. Uh, so merely to uh, recruit and retain the necessary staff, uh, you need to be offering something uh, more generous. And the public sector has been, uh, been squeezed in, uh, in regard of pay for, for several years during the austerity years. Uh, so, um, you know, if you were simply to adjust the existing cash limits to take account of higher energy prices, the higher pay pressure so that would point to increasing departmental spending limits by about 20 billion a year um, now you know we're talking about trying to cut spending by you know maybe up to 40 if you wanted to do it predominantly on spending um, on top of that uh, I mean politicians are very keen to talk about efficiency savings and eliminating waste and so forth Sure, there's waste in the public sector, but it ain't so easy to find it and, uh, and get rid of it. And what was easy to find and get rid of, um, that low-hanging fruit has already been long since plucked during the austerity years. Um, so I think inevitably, you know, if, you, if a lot of the burden of the necessary fiscal consolidation comes in spending, it must involve some degradation of the provision of public services. And I think what's missing in the public debate is actually literally any debate about that question, how big do we want the public sector to be? What do we want the public sector to do? Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, there has been this mantra that oh, the, uh, the tax share is at its highest for 70 years or whatever, actually, the share of government spending in GDP and tax in GDP hasn't really varied all that much. It bobbled around a bit. But underlying it, there are some very strong trends which are driving components like health and benefits up, particularly aging and the nature of technological change in the health sector. In the past, they've been accommodated by cutting public investment, uh, by falling debt interest, and falling defence spending, 
Now, all three of those components are now going in the other direction. Uh, so it's really challenging to put a heavy burden on spending here. So uh, I think um, uh, Hunt and Sunak uh, need to be certainly looking at a significant contribution coming from taxes, unlike during the Osborne uh, years. Then there's the question, of course, what uh, taxes um, and um, some of them are, are off limits and some of them will be politically contentious. So I think the, the, the ultimate question will be not, can you find measures to generate the, the necessary revenues, uh, but will the backbenchers line up to support whatever you choose? Right, and they are uh, factional as we've uh, yeah. discovered. Okay, well, look, great contributions. I want to ensure there's enough time for some questions before Stephanie has to leave, but just to get the discussion uh, rolling a bit further. I think the most, um, one of the sh most shocking things for me, you know, as somebody who's really interested in government and politics in Britain, is in the end, these decisions were made by, in effect, two people. I mean, an enormous degree of concentration of power. We are told, you know, on the kitchen table in Greenwich, uh, the Prime Minister and Chancellor of the Exchequer, before imagining they were going to become this, came up with this extraordinary package, which they then managed not really to prepare anybody for, nobody in government, not even the cabinet really knew all about it. Now tell me I'm wrong about this. It seems an incredible sort of was Henry VIII-like use of power in a way that had no constraints on it. That's my first, I'd like sort of get your response to that. And secondly, as we speak, looking ahead, uh, what next, the government is clearly going out of its way to tell us how bad everything's going to be. It's going to be huge tax cuts, increases, huge public spending cuts. So getting us ready to the point where Chris Mason on the BBC this morning was saying, this is clearly um, managing expectations. But they didn't do any of that with this at all, did they? Well, they were literally, I mean, one of the problems with it and the city's reaction was, or the financial market's reaction, was there was no preparation whatsoever for the scale of it and the lack of any sense of where the money would come from in the long term to pay for the tax cuts and the particular form of tax cuts. So I sort of exaggerating here. You're looking as if I am. No, I think it's, I mean, look, it's easy to blame absolutely everything on Brexit, but I do think there's one, that the Brexit was part of something which did pave the way for at least some of what you've described, which is this sort of the, it was a demonstration, probably the first demonstration, certainly of my, you know, since I was studying um, economics, of where a major vote had happened where it was clear that economics sort of was on, there was an economic cost to doing something and the economics argued for doing X and actually the people chose Y. You know, there was a political dimension which completely trumped the economics and that has not happened on a major scale through um, really from sort of the Thatcherite era, you know, that was the great battle that was won. Um, and after that, so I think a lesson was drawn from that that relates to the sort of, you know, we've had enough of experts, mm. um, the more kind of against orthodoxy, against, you know, arithmetic, mm. your, your policy might be, the more successful politically you could be, because we'd sort of seen that in various different ways. I actually think Boris Johnson, for all his faults, he had a somewhat unsustainable collection of policies, but they did at least have, there was, there was some coherence to it, even if there wasn't really a strategy behind levelling up, there was that actually made sense as a package of things. But that the way he'd presented it, the way he'd become, you know, his whole political record also sent the message that you know you would win by you know being on the outside by having a cabal of a small group of people. And I guess that's the you know for those for those who do still believe in technocrats at least to some degree. And LSE is a you know great breeding ground for technocrats. Um, <laughs> I hope uh, you know this could be a good lesson to have learned that actually you know finally you get some kind of comeuppance for for going against you know the the forces of orthodoxy, which as Charlie says is really just the forces forces of arithmetic. 
Andrew Jones, say it. Yeah, 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 go on. You're the dean. You're in charge. No, I'm, I'm super. <laughs> I want to push the panel a little bit on what is different this time. Uh, you know, the great Ken Rogue of Reinhard book. You know, this time is different, and I suspect it is. And let me make the case for that. Interest rates went up in the world, but a point. It affects everybody. We don't see other countries going crazy because of that. The government announced a package, bad package, silly package, but in the medium term, it added maybe another point, point and a half to the deficit. The UK begins with a public debt to GDP ratio of about 100, um, 99.96. I just looked it up. Um, the average G7 is 140. So compared to the other rich and powerful countries, the UK is doing pretty well. And in addition, the UK is you know, an English-speaking country and it's fairly rich. English-speaking countries that are fairly rich do all kinds of stupid things with their fiscal policies. Ronald Reagan did, Bush Sr. did, Bush, Bush Jr. did, Trump did, nothing happens. So this country does something crazy, starting from reasonable circumstances, and suddenly it is being pummeled by markets. It cannot be the pension bit, because as Gene described it, the pension bit is really a liquidity event, and that's what the Bank of England is for, provides liquidity, it did, problem gone. So something more fundamental changed. Stephanie just provided one hint. She said what changes the politics. This country used to have nice, well-behaved politics. Suddenly, it looks awfully Latin American. Maybe it is the politics. Maybe it is something else. It might be insulting to Latin Americans. So. Well, as, <laughs> I am a Latin American, so I'm allowed to say that. Uh, you're not, but I am. <laughs> so what is it that changed? It, this is not business as usual. Um, suddenly, markets are treating the UK like markets have never treated the UK or the US or Canada or Australia ever before. So what is it? And uh, just to build on this, I mean, Vanessa said to me the other day, if they do this, if the markets can do this to the UK, what will it mean for less powerful economies? So I think it's a, Gene, you want to have a go at that? Yeah, um, no, I think it's a very good question. I kind of make two points. One is, um, you know, I think we've, we've been taught um, that there's not a material constraint on um, a market constraint on a country's financing if it has a fixed a floating exchange rate. So I was a student here 30 years ago. I unfortunately paid my tuition <laughs> the week before sterling devalued. That was, <laughs> so uh, that was, that was uh, the autumn crisis of 1992. Uh, I learned the hard way. But the point was having a floating exchange rate meant that you were typically not going to run into this, into this sort of financing wall. I think the UK, I mean, this to me is partly a function of Brexit and the UK's financing capacity, which expanded with EU membership, contracted with, um, with Brexit um, at the same time that its own current account deficit expanded. So I think that's, I think it, from that perspective, you know, the UK has become a little bit more unexceptional. It's sort of like the rest of the world bar a few uh, reserve currency countries um, that have, and particularly the US, that have sort of an exceptional or exorbitant privilege. I think the other thing that's very different about the current concept, the current context, and this is more generalized, it, it does go back to the pension fund question. You know, the, the role that bonds play in portfolios, you know, governments are meant to be able to step in when the private sector retrenches. They borrow more in a recession, they smooth the recession out. In this case, um, the liability-driven investing industry had been subject to re repetitive shocks going back to the, the global financial crisis. The difference this time was that that shock involved a material sell-off in bonds. You have an inflation constraint. It makes it much more difficult you know, for any portfolio to work where you have bonds offsetting risky assets, uh, but it also makes it more difficult for governments and it, and it, poses, it imposes a more binding constraint on what the government can do or a more uh, demanding environment. Okay, now I want to see if there are any questions from the audience specifically for Stephanie. Oh, God. No, no, because she's got to go early. And I, no, no, there may not be. Yes, right at the back there. So, and then come to here, but right at the back. This is really bad because normally you can deflect and say, well. No, no, not now. Really put me All on to the you. Spot. Hi, um, I have two parts to my question. Um, it might reflect the echo chamber that I live in. 
Um, but a lot of the coverage of what was this, these are just really bad policies. Um, and I never really got from Trust and Quartang what the benefits of what they were trying to do other than the kind of abstract Singapore on Thames concept. So what were the perceived or theoretical benefits of what they were doing? And then is there, you kind of talked about the liabilities in some of the ways where it didn't work. Would there have been a way they could have introduced these policies and they would have worked? Do take the well, one as well? Okay, why not come yeah. to the gentleman at the front? Let's do the two, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you all very much. Um, I've um, worked for European Commission programs in the Ukraine. And if there's any self-criticism going on here um, among Treasury, Bank of England, and so on, believe you me, um, it's mild indeed compared with the, the foul ups Brussels made in the Ukraine. My question is um, tax. Because you, you all seem to be hinting that there's going to have to be a heavy element of tax increases, and that's what we're hearing. Um, what are the vibes about where those taxing, what, how should those tax increases be applied? And indeed, what do you think they should be applied to? Both windfall taxes and permanent taxes or long term taxes. Thank you. Um, I suspect Charlie's going to have a good yeah, uh, few here. things to say about the, the, the second one. I mean, just on the first, I think that's a fair point. Um, I think the one of the other one of the um, messaging and sort of explanatory failures of the mini budget was the lack of detail and the lack of kind of um, proper describing of the growth plan, the stuff that was actually sensible. So the supplies, a lot of the supply side stuff was perfectly sensible and i think there was this idea that it would be you you, would, you announce all the exciting tax cuts but then mm. over the next few weeks we would have got more details on the planning reforms more details on the competition you know having much more competition in in, <coughs> in industries i think what was what was a bit puzzling about it is although all of some of the things they were talking about were could potentially have positive effects they were either things that we'd already done rather more than many other countries, you know, going down the deep, if you look at sort of rankings of our level of regulation as an economy and the World Bank rankings or others, we already, you know, thanks to the Thatcher years and some governments since then, um, are a pretty liberalised, um, you know, deregulated economy, much easier to set up a business here than in most of Europe, for example. Um, so it's not clear there's sort of diminishing returns on that and where they were potentially um, significant like planning reform building more household building more houses making it easier quicker to build infrastructure they were things that particularly tories tend to oppose on the ground so there was a kind of political credibility question of is this government as well as spending all this money and potentially you know making all these enemies in the markets also going to make lots of enemies among its kind of natural supporters, whether it's the people in leafy suburbs and rural areas, or in fact, industries that are sitting in nice protected sectors that were going to be shaken up and made more competitive. So that was the disconnect. It wasn't that it was, you know, on its on its on their face, those policies could have contributed to growth. They weren't going to make growth. What was it? Two and a half percent. They were going to. Yeah, there was a, an increase from add a one percent a year to our long term potential growth rate, which no country's achieved for a long time um, without a lot of inward migration. But they could have. They could have made a positive difference. But it wasn't explained, and it wasn't particularly explained how it would come out. How it would be combined with continued support for a conservative government. I think. It's they used the word, I mean, I was amazed myself, disruption, and a, a, a more negative word it's hard to conceive of. Well, except, no, but lives. that goes back to the Brexit thing. Know, We've come know. to think that, you know, the Conservatives are the party of disruption and radicalism and risk-taking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> disruptive train journeys, disruptive plane but journeys. But the voters are not route. necessarily the same. Now, Charlie, you, you did talk about the types of different ways of putting up tax to raise tax. And clearly, it can be done better or worse, given where the government's got to. So, do you want yeah, to... I mean, there's there's a big menu of things that you might uh, choose to go for. So, you mentioned windfall taxes, which are obviously relevant in the near term for uh, energy, uh, and that's an obvious 
thing to do. Um, I think there's actually quite a good argument for increasing taxes on the banks at the moment. Um, we will be going through a period where banks' profit margins increase, in part because of the increase in bank rate. And the way QE works, uh, as bank rate goes up, so the Bank of England will be paying uh, increased uh, interest to the, the banks. But, it, but aren't windfall taxes, however popular they may sound, just another way of political class not confronting? No, yeah, yeah, no, no, sorry. I'm just right. giving you a look. Okay, so, right, sorry. So, sorry. so it's, it's kind of windfall taxes were mentioned to begin with. I thought I would just slip in that yeah. as okay. an additional uh, 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 additional thing that you might do. As I say, in many ways, the, the, the most natural thing to do would be to have made sure the health and social care levy went through, because I think that's worth 13 billion or something like that, um, which makes a, uh, a pretty significant uh, contribution to filling the hole. If you say, well, you know, we, we, uh, we've introduced it and now we've reversed it, you know, are we going to do the hokey cokey and bring it back again? Uh, that might be a bridge too far, in which case you start looking at the other big uh, taxes, which like income tax, uh, VAT, uh, so forth. Income tax is a better tax uh, to go for. Uh, you could talk about introducing things like wealth taxes, reforming property taxes, stuff like that. They're things which are quite difficult to do quickly. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for trying to improve the uh, design of the UK tax system, which is very complicated. It's got, had lots of knobs and whistles and exceptions and so forth built in. And actually, we need a reforming chancellor who said, you know, my aim is going to be to simplify the tax system. But it's not something that you can do in a couple of weeks. You know, it's several years work to do that. It didn't quasi passing abolish the Office for Tax and Simplification. Yeah, so it's a natural place to start. Well, except the argument is going to be that, you know, it, it's supposed to be the responsibility across government to achieve this. But, um, you know, I, I, I thought it seemed a very strange signal to, uh, to be sending. Oh, well, one thing actually, which um, since Stephanie mentioned it, but I think it is relevant, I and mean, we were talking about tax or spend, uh, but uh, immigration, increasing immigration, is one way that you can. Uh, raise. The has made this point privately, haven't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and that you can get an effect, uh, you know, relatively so. uh, quickly and, and directly. Um, so, um, you know, that, that, that is something they could do. Of course, that is contentious with some parts of the Conservative Party. Well, and particularly the Home well. Secretary, of course. Uh, uh, intriguing. Uh, I mean, uh, the, thing that, the thing, of course, is worth, is worth saying here as well, in the context of the, the sort of um, constraints on the UK economy and the inflationary pressures, one of the reasons we have those is because the labour force is half a million smaller than it was before the pandemic. Um, and this is mainly older workers who've taken early retirement, or in some cases they're waiting for operations in the NHS or whatever. Um, you don't see anything like the same sort of pandemic effect in, in Europe. Uh, but something that got some of those workers back into the labour force or filled the uh, vacancies that we have with, uh, with migrants uh, would allow us to have a faster growth rate, and that would help to solve the problem. Very interesting article I read, I think it appeared in, in both online and then elsewhere, about how almost all the supply side economic policies that the Conservative government proposed are most opposed by its own supporters, yeah. I mean, it's definitely not, <laughs> rather than by Labour. Stephanie, I know you've got to go, much. thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's take some, um, unless you, let's take some more questions from the floor. So, ah, uh, lots of, okay, right. One, let's take them in threes, two, three. I'll come to you, I promise. So one, two, three. 
easier for the microphone this way. I, I know so far we, we, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Aditya, I'm a master's student at, at LSE. So far we've been discussing the more longer run structural issues on that end. But on Thursday, we have a meeting at the Bank of England, and this is being conducted ahead of the release of the budget that Rishi Sunak has asked an extension for. So I would be intrigued to know what you, know, you as academics think are the steps that the Bank of England should be thinking about in the context of the present economic climate and how it can then translate into longer run gains. Very good point, because the point was that when, when the um, statement was moved from the end of November to the 31st of October, it was precisely to be ahead of this meeting, and now it's on the other side of it. So I think we'll turn to Charlie for that one, but it doesn't mean others won't. And then, yes, at the front. Oh, or, sorry, I'll come back. <laughs> Thank you for your discussion so far. Without wishing to guess the age of the panel, I was wondering, you've all alluded to events in your economic lifetime, particularly at students, which left a mark. I was wondering if you think this event, particularly in the context of the economic and political turbulence of the UK for the last 10 years, will see and have the same impact on students nowadays in the next 20, 30, 40 years when some of us are in potential positions of power? I think you've almost answered that question yourself. It's a really nice question as well. I'm going to come back to the front now. Was it epoch or it's a very good uh, Thanks, Tony. Um, so just a couple of quick, quick questions. Uh, so Alex spoke about uh, lack of opportunity to have signature pol policies given proximity to elections. Uh, and we were just speaking about tax being possibly the, the obvious starting point for where we get the money to fund what comes next. Uh, but just linking those two things together, uh, would increasing income taxes here then be political suicide for, for the next elections? And if you increase corporate taxes, which it looks like it's happening, is there a risk of industry flight? So you, you spoke about taxing the banking sector, for instance, or you look at the tech sector, do they just get up and leave? So are, are both of these real risks for uh, what happens next with the economy itself and, again, the, the elections? Okay, very good. Um, let's do them in that order. Charlie, what about the, what are your first to our colleagues at the bank going to be thinking about yeah. meeting on the third? Uh, I mean, it's funny because, uh, I mean, Andrew Bailey had sort of said, oh, we're going to be flying blind. I, I think this is making more of a fuss than is actually appropriate because the MPC meet regularly. It used to be every month when I was on it, it's now every six weeks. But you know, you're always taking decisions, or you're frequently taking decisions ahead of somebody else, the government or whoever taking a decision, or the Fed taking an important decision or whatever. So you have to have to take it in the context of uncertainty. Um, now, um, the, the bank and the treasury teams talk uh, to each other regularly, and the OBR as well also. Uh, talk to the bank team. Uh, so the communication line is quite good on, you know, everybody so, sort of... So the OBR, without letting any state secrets out, um, would be able to communicate to the bank even now about what their forecasts are showing, with, even if they're not published? Uh, the, 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 they will be saying roughly, okay. certainly where the pre-measures forecasts Ah, the thing is that the measures themselves are not finalised, uh, so you don't know what's going to, how it's going to look after the Chancellor's taken its decisions. Uh, but discussions over sort of key judgments in the forecast and roughly where the forecast is going, um, that the the bank team and the OBR team uh, would communicate over. Yeah, so we know we know what. Each other is thinking. I should say, since it wasn't mentioned in the introduction, as well as working at the bank after I left at the bank, I spent five years at the SER. Yes, so. Uh, so I'd sort of seen it from both sides uh, there. But you know, the issue here is that the government hasn't yet firmed up its measures, but I think the MPC can at least take it that. Um, well, Hunt has already reversed two thirds 
of mini budget measures. And there's a clear signal that there is significant more to come. So they, they have a, a, a broad idea. And in particular, uh, they don't have to be tightening policy significantly to offset a significant fiscal loosening, which was the case after the uh, trust budget had been enacted uh, and the, uh, the bank had signaled that clearly. So Hugh Pill in a speech said there will have to be a significant policy response, which the markets, I think, interpreted as at least a hundred basis point uh, increase. Uh, I think you know that is no longer necessary because of the essentially the U-turn on fiscal policy. So uh, less than so three quarters of a percent. Well, I, I I think the open question will be between you know whether they continue with their fifty basis point steps or whether they feel, given what the Fed has done and the ECB has done, do they need a bigger step. I, I think they could rationalize 50 by saying, you know, the uh, fiscal stance is not yet finalized. You know, we can look at it after yeah. the next week and just do 50 this time. It wouldn't surprise me if it, it's a split vote though. Right, very good. Gene, and I'll come to you for the events in history one. But... I, yeah, I, I would agree with Charlie that they could easily justify it, but I hope they don't. Um, I, you know, I would, I would sort of offer the example before the budget where the market was expecting 75 and they hiked 50 and the market immediately priced a higher terminal rate for policy. Um, my own view would be, and I think the market's view is that you have a real inflation problem here in the UK and the bank in some senses has a very low bar for surprising the market um, somewhat hawkishly in reestablishing that credibility. The market is already expecting successive 75 basis point hikes. At a minimum, I think you need to meet that or else the market will expect even, even higher because that inflation problem just is quite entrenched. Yeah, I, I, think, I should say, I agree with the, the Gene's diagnosis that there's, there's more persistence in the inflation process. Than, and at uh, some level that, that, I mean, one way or another, Larry Summers has remarked, I mean, that somehow, uh, um, put it rather crudely, as some kind of a slump has to be staged here in order to, okay. to bring, uh, bring control to all of which, which indeed the bank has said in its last inflation report to have a, a, a recession. In that. So. I think, um, it, just to add one other point, I mean, I, I personally think it would be smart for the bank to stop selling gilts, right. um, given that we seem to have a gilt glut at the moment. Um, I, I, I thought one of the things that didn't really get brought up earlier was just uh, the fragility of the Bank of England's independence. Mm -hmm. You know, the bank has only been independent for 25 years. Um, ironically, the, the person who worked most on that um, at the Treasury was um, the, the civil servant who was fired by Kwasi Kwarteng's father. Um, <laughs> and, you know, th this government was a government that was based, or the previous government was a government that was blaming the bank for what had happened. Um, so I think that to me is something that is a little bit distinct from, you know, from what Quartang did, which was kind of an extreme version of ignoring advice. They just fired the, the advisors they didn't like. But plenty of governments ignored good advice. In this case, going after the Bank of England was something institutionally very threatening to me. Right. Important point. I'll come on to it now. What about these events in history? I mean, is this is this up there? We were talking before. Is this up there with the Suez Crisis? I mean, I, nineteen thirty-one. I'd be a little bit skeptical of that. I mean, it, you know, we're we're all rather excited by the moment at the moment. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of plurie crisis, omni crisis, uh, Twitter crisis. Um, but I think there's actually something quite important about this. What what will be remembered is if there is a sustained cost of living crisis that scars a generation. And we don't yet know whether that is what's going to be in frame, not just through this winter, but over the next couple of years. As an aside, it's interesting, in an age we know everything and our phones can guide us anywhere, we still don't know the name of the period we're living in. You know, I was born during the Cold War. I don't know what period of time I'm living in right now. Is it interwar years? Is it something else? Um, so we haven't yet, you know, historians will name our age uh, we're not necessarily able to do so. I did want to say something very quickly about taxes, though. I'm not a great fan of taxes, even though I have been a beneficiary as a bureaucrat for a very long time. 
Um, but um, but I think it's just worth saying um, on the evening of the uh, the mini fiscal event, I had dinner with a range of people who are very high taxpayers indeed, uh, and predominantly a group of you know I would assume conservative supporting business people and bankers in London. And what was interesting to me was the appetite to pay more taxes uh, and the disdain for what one participant called Klarna policymaking. Klarna policymaking. Uh, buy now, pay later. Uh, so I think there's a recognition uh, which interested me uh, amongst the community that traditionally I think would have been very strong advocates for uh, maintaining low levels of taxation and indeed aspiring to lower taxation, uh, recognising, if you like, the scale of the challenge for the UK economy right now and the materiality of a collective need to commit to help to uh, remedy that. Stability, I presume they, they like stability as well as low taxes, I'm guessing there's a trade off there. Question here and then here, and, and I promise you, oh, you've been waiting at the back, so there. And then, and then at the back. Thanks. Um, obviously, it still feels on the basis of the last few weeks like it uh, very much could happen between now and then, but there is obviously a general election um, at some point in the not too distant future. In the base of current polling, looks like Labour could be in power. I wondered what the panel thought um, a Labour government might expect, the kind of economic climate they might expect to find themselves within, operating within, and what they might expect to do um, once they're in power. Okay, that's certainly what next, or it could be what next, potentially what next. And Renes, I'll come to you, but there's a guy at the back, you've had your hand up, you've been very patient, yeah. And I promise we'll get to everybody if we keep moving. Yep. So, uh, Professor Evans already mentioned the cost of living crisis and how perhaps this uh, fiscal event could, in, uh, by future generations, be seen more as a small interlude in a greater context if that is not uh, kind of uh, tackled. So, my question is more like about the uh, what next now. Uh, that has been mentioned by Sir Bean that uh, there might be a need for a uh, reduction in public sector pay. But on the other hand, as been mentioned, uh, there is a uh, crisis in the NHS. There is a high inflation uh, at the same time as many sectors have experienced wage freezes. And there are a couple of other public institutions that have been severely underinvested over the last few years. So my question would then be, are reductions in public spending even on the table? Or shouldn't there, uh, isn't there almost a need to uh, increase public spending in the short term to offset amongst other things uh, the uh, damage to private finances caused by the mini budget and what that did to mortgage rates, for example. Yeah, it does take us straight back to Stephanie's point about the trade off between trying to keep inflation down and trying to keep the economy running uh, here. And then I'll take Vanessa here. Yeah. Uh, so, my question is uh, that in an environment where we're seeing uh, recessionary pressure as well as inflation, should the fiscal government take a back seat and let the monetary committees decide? where the economy is heading because their appetite for taking decisions that are politically not so viable. Hold the microphone. Uh, that are not so politically viable higher. Like they'd be more interested in raising the interest rate rather than say the government cutting taxes or increasing spending. So should the uh, fiscal committee take a back seat and let the Bank of England decide where the economy is headed and then maybe step into uh, decision making. And then let's take Vanessa. And then we'll come back to the panel. Thank you so much. Um, I have been following up a um, crisis in the emerging uh, market world uh, for, for many years and hopefully being able to prevent some of them. Uh, but when one looks at the UK uh, from a foreign perspective, it is difficult to think of a country that has more institutions, more solid institutions, more history of democracy, checks and balances. And still here we are with two people making this mess. How do, do, how do we see this for the future? What, what is the lesson learned? How to prevent something like this or something like this in other areas no, from happening in the future with all of this infrastructure, with all of this history, with all of these checks and balances? 
Yes, I can do that. That's a version of my question. I completely agree. Right. Um, well, we've got a series of interesting questions here. Uh, do you want to do the um, let's do the cost of living future generations sort of is it really possible to make these kind of cuts to public sector uh, spending and pay? And you mentioned, Charlie, the fact that we are really 12 years into a sort of nearly unremitting period of constraint on public spending. And a 2% pay rise for public sector workers next year sounds to me as if it's just going to end up in strikes, but tell me I'm wrong. Well, no, no, I mean, it's ending up in strikes well, sorry. now already. <laughs> Uh, which is, you know, in, indicative, and we know there's big vacancies uh, in the yeah. parts of the public sector and so forth. So, so I think, uh, you know, it's unsustainable to keep public sector pay that low. Uh, if you maintain the existing cash limits, that must imply uh, a corresponding squeeze, therefore, on the services mm -hmm. and yeah. on the, 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 the volume. I mean, you, you can hope that people will work harder, but they won't be able to fully compensate um, for the, um, uh, the reduction in real spending, uh, if you like. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's very challenging to um, say that a lot of this is going to be found by uh, squeezing down on spending, basically for the reasons that uh, I said earlier on. Um, have, have the, sort of the, the question about um, the sort of cost of living crisis and so forth. I think one of the things that's actually been missing in the, the narrative from the government is actually explaining really what's gone on here is that there's an external shock which makes us worse off yeah. significantly, but you know, by the order of four or five percent of the nation uh, as a result of the, the rise in global prices due to the war in Ukraine. And this is the cost of fighting tyranny, basically. I mean, in Ukraine, people are giving up their lives. Here, basically, we have to suffer a hit uh, to our living standards. Now, there's a question about how it's shared out across the population. And there is also a question about, do you want just the current population to bear it, or do you want to shift it over time? And I do think there is an argument when it comes to the uh, energy price guarantee part of the package to say that should be borrowed by, uh, that should be financed uh, very largely by borrowing. You can do a bit through windfall taxes, but it makes sense to borrow it in exactly the same way as with the pandemic. It made sense. You had an extremely unusual large shock where it was sensible for the state to stand in that basically it's an insurer. Um, and, you know, I can see the same argument here, but it, it needs to be temporary, and then you shift the burden. Uh, so it's shared across uh, generations. But it, it does seem to me the, the narrative that, um, that we are made worse off as a country, and as indeed, you know, all the European countries uh, are, you know, that's got lost. With all Politicians the find it almost impossible to do this, don't they? I mean, ever, you know, think of Theresa May's of Brexit that works for everyone. I was thinking yeah. when Stephanie was speaking earlier. I mean, you know, Brexit, Brexit works for some people, doesn't work for the country as a whole. I'm not saying that's what was, you know, the truth, but, you know, it wouldn't have come across so well. But just on the, I mean, given that you mentioned that you were working at the Treasury in the 70s, it's worth adding for those of you who are interested in this, stuff that the UK government used to publish all its public spending documents in what was called volume terms. They didn't do cash planning, they planned in real terms, but now they plan only in cash. I mean, there are some real terms, GDP deflator, um, deflated numbers, but this does open this fascinating portal for politicians being able to say, public spending is going up next year when it's going up by one pound nominally, even if it's falling by 10% in real terms. That does create a portal for misunderstanding, in my view. Anyway, Gina, now I'll come on. To, sorry, should do it the other way around this time. Can't you? It just on, on any of them? On any of them, <laughs> yes. I'm just opening cost of living, um, yeah, labor I mean, I, win. I, want, I wanted to make, UK uh, I guess, two points. OK, um, on, on sort of you know what the labor government might be expected to face um, 
you know, I think what has happened has made it very difficult for labor. Obviously, um, the burden is less than it is on the current government, um, but they have a lot of expensive plans which they need to find a way to finance. I think in some ways it comes down to what the trust government, at least on paper, was trying to achieve, which is what is the post-Brexit growth strategy? There is no growth strategy. Um, and at some level, we need to come back to what that growth strategy is rather than cutting, 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 um, you know, the, the fiscal deficit. I think if I, I draw the example, which I think Vanessa will appreciate of um, Bill Clinton and NAFTA. Um, it was only, I would argue, a Democrat that could deliver a free trade deal with Mexico because that was such a democratic issue. You needed someone that was kind of a natural opponent uh, you know, from the constituency that would generally be opposed to push it forward. Um, and I think in that respect, you know, I did hear one treasury official, maybe it was sort of hopefully saying, you know, maybe this will at least reopen the possibility of rejoining the customs union. I wouldn't predict that. I think it's a high bar. Um, but I think the notion of trying to get more taxpayers in through immigration, Liz Truss surprisingly announced she was going to allow 80,000 more immigrants in. Apparently, they don't have the, the money to process them. That's a bit of a problem. Um, but the idea, at least, is the right one. And similarly, I think in terms of rejoining the customs union, those are paths to getting some kind of growth, growth strategy. Um, the, the other point I wanted to make, um, which I think if I understood um, uh, your, your question about fiscal and monetary cooperation, um, I thought that was a very interesting one because um, you know, you had alluded to the, the 1950s period, which I guess was the last great period of fiscal repression. Um, it's very difficult to have, you know, the kind of fiscal monetary cooperation when you have a central bank that's targeting a very low uh, inflation rate. Um, uh, but maybe that's, you know, one, one kind of division of labor that you could imagine where, you know, either the government does the heavy lifting or the central bank does the heavy lifting. If the central bank is in charge of dealing with inflation, they should probably do the heavy lifting on that. And then the government uh, can probably use, you know, its safe asset status to, to borrow a little bit more. I think if you had a growth strategy, that would actually be possible. Um, I'm not sure how, to, I was thinking of Vanessa's question. It's really, I mean, I still sort of view what happened here as an extreme version of ignoring, um, you know, good advice, which happens all the time in many, many different governments. In this case, they just fired the good advisors. Um, but the notion that you can have a prime minister that's elected by the subset of one party constituency, I think, you know, speaks to a different kind of reform that's needed here. That, that just seems... Uh, and you could argue that it's intriguing that the other major party didn't really complain about that. And that suggests that they are sort of, they both have the same kind of problem in the way they select their leader, but that's for another day. It's a good point. I, I just wonder on the institutions thing, but the fact that this has all been reversed so quickly is actually an indication mm -hmm. of the fundamental right. strength of the institution. You know, in this case, the, the abacus strikes back. Agreed. <laughs> that way it's not under <laughs> um, Alexander, now you've worked in these solid institutions. Yeah. Did you, do you look at do you look at them? What's happened as a sort of, you know, threat to all you held dear when you were working in them, or just the normal, you know, these things happen every now and again. Sterling crises, you know, <laughs> just happens every now and again. But they do happen every now and again, don't they? So hu human beings make decisions. Um, politicians may take or not take advice. Uh, let's remember we've had a series of crises in the UK uh, in recent years, uh, you know, everything from uh, small boats to uh, responding to COVID uh, to uh, looking at, uh, at um, uh, you know, to, to Ukraine. So, so isolating this particular moment neglects even recent institutional history and experience in government. I'm a bit more sanguine. I, I think, look, you know, elected politicians take decisions. Those decisions may or may not be judged as being wise by the markets, but guess what? We live in a democracy. Uh, that's how our system works. And relatively few people make decisions. Uh, and and uh, yeah, one of my favorite uh, memoirs is by a former US Assistant Secretary of Commerce. And it's the only memoir I've read where uh, the, the individual begins his book by acknowledging his relative unimportance in the US federal government. 
Yeah? Mm -hmm. Given most people, uh, you know, most people exaggerate uh, through anecdotage uh, their influence on decision making. Uh, actually, it's quite refreshing to remember that only a very small number of people really truly make strategic policy decisions that impact on a government as a whole. Uh, and they can have consequences for good or ill. Um, I think we'll learn in 20 years time um, when the uh, papers are declassified, what senior officials said to the prime minister and the chancellor as they made those decisions. Uh, all we'll learn in the Sunday Times, uh, if it's leaked in a week's time. Um, but, but, but remember the Sunday Times leak is invariably on behalf of somebody who wants their story told. So actually the archives probably give us the fullest picture a little bit later on. So I'm a bit more sanguine about the state of affairs with, with the system. Um, but, I, but I just wanted to um, touch, if I may, on, on the public sector pay issue. Um, I think public servants, and I would say this, wouldn't I, Gov, as uh, having been one for 20 years, but have, have, have done an awful lot, um, particularly over the last couple of years. Um, but at the same time, it's likely to be a softening labour market as we turn through the winter. Uh, and it's not as if lots of people will necessarily have other options to go to. It's been a very overheated labour market with the combination of a great res resignation and lots of people hiring and a lot of people having exited the UK labour market. Uh, people have felt footloose and fancy free in 2022. Uh, when your mortgage rate goes up or your rent goes up and you're facing the cost of living challenge uh, and the, the employment market seems a little bit less fizzy, uh, uh, the likelihood to uh, stick rather than twist, I think will grow in 2023. And that does, I'm afraid, offer a little bit of leeway, I think, for government to be a little bit brutal about cost control in the public sector. There will be a, a, an effect of that, uh, not just on morale, there will be effect, I think, in terms of concerns about industrial action. Uh, but you know, against, against the likely labour market next year, uh, that is a, it is a choice that would be open to the government. But my final comment, if I may, is I just, I just want to pick up a little bit on, on um, the, the comment about disruption earlier. And, and picking up on what Charlie said as well, I think there's a, there's a the, the, the array of challenges for the state in the UK, as with other economies, particularly around demography and ageing and our dependency ratio, um, merit a much more strategic discussion about what do we want from government? What is the right balance of uh, tax uh, and, and the state to the market? Uh, what do we expect of the state? And that conversation is curiously absent, I think, from a lot of policy making. And I think that conversation is needed more than ever. And in, in that regard, I would argue that um, there's, a certain, there's a certain merit in Elon Musk policy making in two directions, right? You want to have Elon Musk, he's been doing the, um, what will be, he's been doing his anchoring, right, on how much you're going to pay for a tick mark, for the blue tick mark on Twitter. And he started high, he's going down lower in his latest tweets. And um, so that's a bit like the signalling from Rishi Sunak about the economic challenges ahead and the tough choices that government might make um, as it goes. But I think there is also an argument for disruption and innovation in policy making. And if you like, if, if, if too much radicalism comes with a, an upset stomach and a morning after feeling the next day, too little radicalism uh, leads to incrementitis. Uh, and that's a, I think that's a real danger for an economy and a society and a state like Britain. Thank you. We must, it is now two minutes past eight and we must, I'm afraid for those of you who want to ask a question, stop, we can rush up and ask it individually if you wish. Um, or I, we didn't manage to talk about the triple lock or the National Health Services funding, which I think will be a big signifier of how radical the government's prepared to go. But just in this final point, just to, to finish the evening, because it's come up several times. I think one of the, the roles of politicians, certainly in a democracy, is to educate. You know, the, the, the reason that legislatures exist is not just to make laws or to assent to laws, it is to some degree to explain the trade-offs in a sort of visible way so that people have a debate. And I do, and I think Charlie made the point first, but it's come up again at the end here, sort of the, the lack of, not unique to the UK, capacity fully to explain, I mean, to use the cliched way of putting it, that you can't have Sweden or France's public services with America's taxes, which I know is a cliche, but it's actually quite a helpful one, um, is still not out there. And I'm always struck, the Office for Budget Responsibility, I don't think you'll tell me which document it is, publishes, I think annually, and certainly regularly, 
Um, a forward look to the 2060s, so 30 or 40 years fiscal out. Sustainability fiscal sustainability report. You get this online, great stuff. And it shows you, in effect, get me, forgive me if I got this wrong, broadly, how much borrowing the UK government will be doing in 30, 40 years out if you stay with existing tax and spending policies. Yeah. I got that about. That's it's much. shocking yeah. and much under discussed. That's fair, isn't it? Yeah. And shocking yeah. and under discussed. Yeah. So worth looking at that. Anyway, I'd just like to thank. Stephanie, Alexander, Jean, Charlie, uh, and Andres, whose idea it was, and I think Vanessa has handed it as well. So all of us here at the uh, SVP, thank you all for coming. And if you want to ask a particular question of the panel, feel free to rush up now. Otherwise, thank you all. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you all. Good night. <laughs>